So I think we can start. Okay. And first of all, uh, remember what is going to happen in the next uh, week and the weeks in general. Okay. That's always in the schedule of the course. And uh, we will have, well, today, of course, lecture. But um, <coughs> next week, starting Monday 15th, uh, there will be a lab, and then the day after another lab. Okay, so there will there will be two labs in a row. Uh, I'm sorry we cannot separate them uh, too much uh, because uh, you know this room has no plugs, electric plugs, basically. So it's inconvenient for the lab, and that's what we got, uh, unfortunately. Okay. <coughs> in any case. Um, this lab will be about uh, what you saw with my colleague Antonio, who gave the lecture on Monday, last Monday. And uh, the next lab will be about uh, what you are going to see today. Okay? I will publish the solution uh, of lab number five, uh, basically Monday afternoon. Okay? And the solution for last lab, basically this afternoon. So you don't uh, need to, you know, keep the pace with the lab in case you have problems. Uh, just start from our solution, and then you can think about uh, what you could have done with your solution, and then try to modify your solution and so on. But so, even if the lab is, uh, let's say, the the next day, so attached to the to the previous one, you have a starting point on which you can work. Okay. Okay, so basically today we are going to spend the whole lecture uh, talking about uh, JavaScript in the browser. Okay, so JavaScript in the browser means uh, um, no, how do we write the code and what are the functions uh, and the uh, APIs that we can use when we are inside the browser. Okay. Uh, which is basically the first step going towards writing an actual uh, application in JavaScript, which is the aim of this course. Okay. Um, okay. So we will have a look at, at these slides, and then we will try to program something. And as usual, I will publish it uh, as soon as the lecture finishes. Okay. Um, so that's the outline, but we don't care too much. Well, um, on Monday with my colleague Antonio, you, you learned about HTML, okay? So you know that HTML is a way to describe uh, the content of a page, okay? And then there's CSS that helps you to, uh, you know, visualize the content in a, in a nice way, okay? Inside the HTML, we have a, a particular tag which is called script, okay? which can uh, load uh, JavaScript code. And that's what's interesting for us for today's lecture. Okay? So it could be an inline uh, tag in the sense that between the start and the end of the tag, you can write your code. But this is not so you know, uh, useful because uh, we don't like to mix code uh, of different types. So we don't like to mix JavaScript with HTML with CSS. Okay? It's uh, possible, but uh, if it's better if things uh, are separated, in, especially in different files, in different resources. So that's why last time you wrote uh, CSS in a .css file, so in a separate file. And we will do the same ops, uh, uh, for JavaScript content as well. Okay, JavaScript programs as well. So in short, with this uh, script tag, you have an attribute SRC in which you can specify a resource to load. And actually, that's a program, okay, a JavaScript program that will run into the browser environment. Okay? And today, we'll learn uh, how to write it. Okay? First, where do we put the script tag? Um, when you talked about HTML, you know that uh, there are basically two main parts in HTML, the head section and the body section, right? And actually, this tag works uh, in both parts, OK? So you can write it in the head section, uh, but also uh, um, in the body. And typically, in the body, you write it at the end, because the program, the JavaScript program, wants to manipulate the HTML content. So the HTML content should be already defined when you load the JavaScript program. That's why you put it at the end. Okay. Um, 
So that's a very uh, basic solution. We will see a better way in a minute. Okay. But you can load the, the script, uh, the, the JavaScript program basically everywhere you like. Okay. If you put into the add section, actually uh, the following thing happens. So when the HTML parser encounters the script tag, it stops the in interpretation of the HTML content. It goes to the resource that we specify, so the script, loads the script, and run the scripts, okay? So basically everything is stopped until we load and run the program. And that's quite inconvenient. And also putting it into the head section is not so convenient because the HTML part has not been defined yet. So uh, what are you going to manipulate in the page? You, you have nothing in the page yet, okay? So, well, um, there will be a, a trick to, to, to place in the script tag in, in the most efficient ways for our program, okay? Um, if you don't know what to do, well, uh, what we already did, you did it for a Bootstrap, for instance, that has a JavaScript part to make something dynamic in the page. You actually put it in the, at the end of the body, okay? Inside the body, but as the last thing in the body, so everything is already loaded. That's fine, but we could do better, okay? Because the body, we typically would like to use the body to, you know, specify the content of the page, not the programs and all the meta stuff that comes with the page, okay? As we don't write the CSS here, but you w we write the CSS in the head part, okay? So that's what happens, it's just a nice, well, almost nice picture <laughs> of what is happening. Okay, taken taken by from this uh, website, which is uh, very active in uh, you know describing things in JavaScript, especially explaining basic things. Um, so it's nice to have it at the end of the body, uh, but uh, actually we would like to have it I I into the head part. But uh, if you put it there, you know the HTML is not defined yet, and we need to wait uh, for the loading and execution of the script. Remember, also loading. We are loading resources from the network. Network can be slow, okay? So the HTML is already there and we are not parsing it uh, until the end. We are just stopping, okay? And there can be a problem. Think always in terms of the user experience. We are designing an interface uh, of, a w of an application and so you need to think in terms of the user experience. If, if you stop doing things and resume later, basically it means that the application is not loaded yet. The user cannot interact. Or if it interacts, uh, uh, it doesn't work as expected. So, you know, you should uh, load things as fast as possible, okay? As, you, as when you open a, a standalone application, you expect that when the application is loaded, everything is ready, okay? The, the same feeling should happen when you work with the web application. So to improve on this behavior, uh, two new attributes has been defined for the script tag that are basically nowadays supported by all browsers. One is async, that means uh, don't wait when you load the resource and just execute the resource when it's ready, okay? But actually it doesn't really uh, solve all our problems because we still have the problem of having the whole JavaScript, uh, whole HTML loaded, okay, loaded and parsed. So actually, this tag, the second tag, defer, is much more useful, okay, because it does exactly what we would like to have: uh, loading the resource in parallel to the rest that the browser is doing, okay, and then execute. So defer the execution of the code when the uh, content of the document has been parsed. So uh, all the HTML code has been interpreted and loaded into the memory of the browser, okay? Also, it guarantees the, the scripts are executed in the order they are loaded, so uh, in the order that we specified uh, them. Uh, in, um, um, also, if uh, one uh, is fetched uh, faster than the other, okay? So basically, uh, let's say, let's summarize uh, all the discussion here saying, well, when you load a script, uh, you 
uh, you can put the script in the head section and load it uh, with the defer attribute. Okay, that's all. And that basically solves uh, all your problems. Okay, that's fine. And this works uh, for, for any kind of uh, JavaScript code. So that's uh, the picture for what we just uh, said. So with the uh, async, uh, in short, we just uh, avoid uh, avoided uh, blocking the HTML parsing, but actually we would like to have the execution at the end and the loading in parallel. Okay, when the the script is specified, the browser knows it's a script, and so goes and, and loads the resource. But in the meanwhile, it continues parsing the HTML code. Okay, so that's the situation we would like to have. Okay, fun. So we have a way to specify, uh, you know, how to load the JavaScript code in the browser. And now we need to think about uh, what we are going to write in this uh, in this file. So in this pr JavaScript program. Well, first of all, we need to think where this program runs. Okay, we are already seen programs in JavaScript, and the, the place where we run the programs was the Node.js environment, right? So it's a st another standalone program. Here, the standalone program is the browser, and the script is executed within the browser. Actually, within a, a specific environment, the browser creates exactly for executing the JavaScript, uh, which is a, actually a sandbox. Sandbox uh, means uh, uh, like a box uh, outside which the program cannot go. Okay, so it, it's a way to to to. Um, to limit what the program that you loaded can do, okay? Um, <coughs> okay, that's a concept of the sandbox. Um, okay, uh, in this sandbox, the JavaScript code will see an environment as it sees in, in, in Node. So there are predefined functions available from the environment, predefined variables, objects, and so on. Okay, so what we need to understand now is what is available in the browser. And what is available in the browser is actually this uh, um, root object which is called the window. Okay, that contains uh, everything we need to interact uh, with uh, um, the browser <coughs> uh, and uh, uh, everything we need to run, um, we need uh, to, to run JavaScript. Okay, um, okay so in short, we have uh, all the functions of the JavaScript standard library, more or less like in Node.js, okay? But in addition, we have these two other objects, so the browser object and the document object, okay? One of these uh, objects uh, will provide us uh, specific functions uh, of the browser environment, like function to load the new resources, so make a network request to load new resources that we will use later. And today we will focus on the document object that basically is a representation of the content of the page in the memory of the browser. And we, we, have, we will have a, a function that we can use uh, on this object to manipulate the content of the page. So in short, to change the, uh, the content and the appearance of the page, okay? Um, before going on, Note that uh, we can uh, load more than one program, okay? As, as we said in the first lecture of this course, every JavaScript program is independent from any other JavaScript program, and every file is a JavaScript program, okay? And so we can have multiple script tags. That means that we are loading different JavaScript programs. How can we interact between these different uh, programs? Well, actually, they all have access to the same global scope, okay? So in short, to this window object, which is shared between uh, all the programs that we load with the different script tags, okay? Of course, this is uh, not a really nice way to cooperate between programs, okay? Global variables in general are not a good idea, okay? And uh, um, I think next week uh, we will uh, see a more uh, let's say, um, a structured uh, collaboration way of doing these uh, operations. So in short, we will talk about modules. That's more or less what, we, what you are, are already doing with the node when you do require something. 
that's a package, that's a module, and so on. We can do it in the browser as well. Okay, but for the moment, uh, we just rely on using uh, more script text uh, when we need uh, to use different uh, um, uh, JavaScript packages and so on. Okay, like for instance, uh, the the package for the date. Uh, you remember the date JS. We will need the package to handle the dates, uh, and we will uh, load with one script our program, with the other script uh, the DJS program, okay? That contains all the code and definition needed to, to handle the dates, okay? Fine. Okay. Um, how does the uh, runtime environment of the browser work? Well, um, as you might... Uh, Let's say, um, so how, how do you say in English? Um, no, you, you might imagine. Um, most of the things in the browser happen asynchronously, okay? Because we handle interaction with the user, okay? So the user, we don't know when the user does an action in the interface, a click, a mouse movement, or another action or when a resource is completely downloaded and loaded into the browser from the network and so on. So most of the events that are happening in the browser happen asynchronously. But it is fine, this is fine for us because uh, you know, we learned uh, to handle asynchronous code very well in previous lectures. You know, we, we uh, discussed about uh, promises uh, and the async await uh, uh, keywords and so on. Uh, that's why we did because we will use it uh, when, when when it's needed, and we also understand how things work. Okay. Uh, you know that JavaScript is single threaded. This is true also for the browser environment. And so let's uh, stop for a minute thinking how things uh, work. Still one more time. Okay. So in short, um, we have an uh, event loop. Okay. Uh, in the browser, uh, we have a message queue, and uh, uh, in short, uh, when there's something that has been uh, that is uh, executed in the synchronous thread of JavaScript, basically nothing else can happen. Okay, but when there's nothing to do because the is the execution of synchronous function in the browser has ended. Basically, the browser goes into the message queue and see if there's something else to be executed. And if in the queue there's something uh, else to be executed, it will start executing that, that uh, typically function, okay? Uh, and so on, okay? And if it's nothing to do, it just waits for something to be put in the message queue, okay? So we have a, a nice picture and also a demo because I understand this is not so easy to to grab by a description. So in short, this, uh, this big uh, um, gray box is the browser. Well, actually the execution environment within the browser, uh, the JavaScript execution environment. You have a call stack where you put, uh, you know, function calls, synchronous function calls. From a function you call another function and so on. There's a typical call stack that you have in any programming language based on functions, okay? You have a, a, a memory heap where you put, uh, you know, the the, the 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 data structures that you define, object uh, arrays, and so on. But here, in addition, you have this event loop that takes uh, uh, functions uh, put into this uh, uh, message queue. Actually, we call it message queue or callback queue. Okay, that's exactly the same stuff. Okay. Um, so, in short, here you have functions that are waiting to be executed by the browser because JavaScript is single-threaded. Until the call stack is empty, nothing can be executed. Nothing else can be executed. Okay, and that's why we would like to write asynchronous code because when we write asynchronous code, in short, when it's needed, the function that we defined with the asynchronous code will be put into the callback queue or the message queue here. And when it's its turn, it will be executed. Okay, very simple. So we'll try to keep uh, functions short because when the call stack is busy, nothing else can be done. Okay, and, um, and that's all. Okay, so let's have a look at the, this uh, demo. So 
uh, it's a clickable link, it's a very long URL. Um, but uh, uh, I think uh, it's worth having a look because uh, it, um, uh, it gives us a very good idea on how things work, okay? So this is a very simple piece of code. Of course, this is just a demo. You can change the code, but you cannot really write a very complex code here, okay? But it's very useful to understand how things work. So this is a program loaded, let's say, into the browser environment, JavaScript environment. So console log A and uh, A again, but in the middle, there's this set timeout to which we pass a function uh, that we will that will execute uh, another console log after a while. That's 5,000 milliseconds or five seconds, okay? So let's have a look on how things work, okay? So this is the call stack. Of course, we are not running anything, so in the beginning, it's empty, okay? And the callback queue or the message queue is empty as well, okay? Um, let's uh, uh, run it, okay? Let's observe the behavior and then we will observe it again. So console log A, set timeout, console log A, and then when the timeout finishes, something will be put in the callback queue, and since the call stack is empty, will be executed, so the first function of the callback queue will be called and put into the stack and it will execute its code. So it will execute the console log C. Let's uh, have a look again, okay? Rerun. So A, set timeout, let's set this timeout, console log A, and then after five seconds, somebody will put uh, the, 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 the function to be executed in the callback queue. Uh, the environment uh, uh, always, uh, uh, let's say, polls uh, for, for waits uh, for for the callback queue. If something appears in the callback queue, and if something appears, it it goes on and executes the function that we put in the callback queue. Okay, so actually, what can be put here is basically a reference to a function. Okay, because it's code to be executed. You cannot put an array, an object, and so on. This this doesn't make sense. Okay, it's something that can be called. And uh, it can be put uh, by uh, library function, like this set timeout, as we saw, that puts the function after a certain amount of time, or it can be put by somebody else, like uh, we saw um, you know, the database for the Node.js, so the database library when it finishes, or for instance, when we finish loading some resources, the browser will put the callback that handles that resource here and when the, the JavaScript execution environment is free, it will start executing that code, okay? Let's have a look uh, uh, one last time, one more and last time, okay? So set timeout, timeout knows that the function to be called is this timeout console log, timeout console log C, okay? And this will be executed when uh, it, it's uh, it's a turn, okay? So just play with this tool, which is linked by the slides, okay? Just to understand, you know, how things work. Of course, in this tool, basically you can create asynchronous events basically only with this uh, set timeout, okay? Because we cannot really use more advanced function, but I mean, it's uh, really interesting to see how things work. Okay. So this summarizes uh, all the discussion that I, uh, I uh, just uh, uh, told you. So we have functions to be, to be put into this message or callback queue, okay? We don't care uh, uh, about who is putting this function into the callback queue, okay? The browser doesn't care. It can be an internal function like the set timeout, can be something that loads from the network, can be an event handler for user interaction, like a code attached to some events, like click on a button on a certain area in the in the window, and so on. Okay, we don't really care when uh, there's nothing being executed by the JavaScript environment. The callback queue uh, is pulled, so it's checked, and if something appears in the callback queue, it will be executed. Okay. Um, 
a function call or even event handler is never interrupted. Okay, so when something gets executed and goes into into this uh, call stack, we cannot stop it. Okay, unless we explicitly say it's something asynchronous, like we do await as we did in the past. Okay, but it depends on what we wrote in the code. If we wrote code that is uh, you know, it takes a lot of time to be executed. The rest of the function will wait in the callback queue. Okay? It's like going to the post office and there's just one, one guy serving all the requests. Okay? Until the, the guy before you uh, is, is uh, asking things, you, you, it's not your turn and you will wait. Okay? So all this function will wait. Very simple. So try to write code. Uh, which is not taking too much time, okay? Uh, of course, if you have to do operation, you need to write code, that's, that's fine. But if the operation can be made asynchronous, make it asynchronous, because in this way, you don't block everybody else, and simply you will be put into the callback queue when it's your turn to, be, to process data, okay? Or to process whatever you need to process, okay? So that's... That's uh, the, the reason why we always say avoid blocking code. Because blocking code means that nothing can happen. You have a, a handler, so a function, some code registered to handle a click or whatever in the interface of your web application. If it's not executed uh, uh, quickly, basically the user cannot see the result of the click, okay? Because uh, the browser is executing something else, okay? But typically, you don't do very complex computation in the browser, okay? So this is typically not a problem unless you really write uh, bad code, okay? But we will try to avoid writing bad code, okay? Okay, so we know how the um, JavaScript environment works, and in particular, how it executes code. And so now we can focus on um, what is provided by the browser environment, so the browser object model, okay? So in short, we are, um, we are here, okay? No, boom, uh, where's, where's the, no, sorry. Yeah, the browser object, no, the browser object model here, okay? BOM, the, the central column, okay? So in short, window contains all this stuff that you see on the right, so it's uh, like a big object with many properties. There's a document property where we talk about this uh, uh, um, in a few minutes. And let's have a look at the uh, properties that uh, uh, regards the browser um, um, object model. Um, just to tell you that they exist and they can be useful for something, but we will not use them uh, at the moment, okay? So in short, they allow to interact with the browser um, actually, unfortunately, it's not, uh, this browser object model is not standardized, but let's say that is more or less standard in the sense that, you know, modern browser more or less all implement at least the basic functions, the basic uh, um, uh, properties of this browser object model. So uh, location, for instance, is available in any browser as well as history and so on, okay? Um, okay, um, how do we access uh, these uh, properties? Well, we can write window dot with an, you know, notation to access properties in an object, JavaScript object. Uh, so we can write windows dot document or windows dot navigate, windows dot location dot history and so on. But we can also omit uh, uh, window, okay? Because basically, when you refer a global object in the browser, it's just window, okay? So we can write simpl simply document or location, etc. okay? Um, well, there's a number of uh, um, uh, properties. Uh, we will focus on document especially. Uh, if you're just curious, you can have a look at history and location, but when it's time, we will focus on them, okay? We will tell you how to use them. Uh, typically, we will try not to use them, but, uh, you know, for location, location sometimes it can be, uh, it might be needed, okay? 
Um, okay. So let's come to the browser. No, sorry, the document object model. Okay. The document object model. Uh, we, we, there are a lot of resources about this stuff online, but in general about web application. Uh, there are many things uh, that you can be said about this. We will focus only on the most important things as usual. Okay? So let me just check everything is fine. Yes. Because repeating all this stuff is <laughs> would be boring. Okay, so what's a document object model? Well, actually, it's a data structure inside the browser that represents our uh, document. Okay, the, the document that is currently loaded by the browser, which is specified in terms of the HTML tags uh, that represent the document. Okay. Um, so in short, a, it's a tree. Okay, like the one you see on the right. It's a big tree with a root. The root is HTML, and then there are two leaves, uh, head and body. Okay. And in the add, uh, the add branch is e easier in the sense that typically you don't have con I mean, you, you cannot have content there, okay? You just have meta information like the, the script loading, the CSS loading, or maybe meta information about the, the page like title or a keyword and stuff like that. Uh, and in the body, instead, you will have a, a more complex structure because you need to represent uh, the actual content of the page. So you have a document with a, a, a title, a subtitles, chapters, uh, articles, and, uh, and, and the text, and, and maybe buttons, uh, uh, form fields, and stuff like that. Everything goes into the body, okay? So, or, or a table maybe, and so on, okay? Um, so in short, when the browser loads the HTML document, it parses uh, the HTML uh, strings, so uh, uh, um, less uh, less than sign, name of the tag, uh, you know, greater than sign, etc. All the string that forms the HTML, and it creates this tree inside its memory. Okay, uh, and then with the API provided by the browser to manipulate the document object model, we can navigate inside this tree. And we can chain things inside this tree, so delete and add notes, leaves, and so on. And also uh, modify uh, styling attached to each uh, of these nodes. Okay? And finally, also attach and remove uh, event listeners. Okay? So we can say, let's say, if the table is clicked, if the user clicks, the table, let's perform this action. So let's execute this function, okay? And where is the function put after the user clicks? Well, actually, we saw it before. It's just put into the in, inside the callback or message queue, waiting to be executed. And hopefully, it's executed quickly, because hopefully, this call stack is empty. Okay, and so you immediately see the reaction to the click in terms of, I don't know what happens, the modification of the page, something changes color, the button is pressed, or whatever happens when you want to uh, do this click. And, and you decide what to do with the code attached to the event uh, that is attached to a specific uh, node in this tree. Okay, we will see these things uh, in more details later. Okay. So actually, um, how can we navigate this tree? Well, before navigating the tree, we need to establish some common terminology. Okay. So um, actually, uh, uh, this tree is made of elements. Okay. Actually, a nodes, but a particular node, a very common node, is an element which corresponds to an HTML tag. Okay. So uh, tags are nested, so can be represented uh, through, uh, uh, through a uh, tree, uh, through a tree, sorry. Um, elements can have attributes, okay? Can have text inside, 
some elements can have text inside, like a P, paragraph, for instance, uh, or like uh, span, for instance, and so on. Um, there are also other type of uh, elements like uh, HTML comments, which are less useful for us because they are not shown and they typically don't contain something that we would like to handle. It's just for you know the, the programmer who reads the code. Uh, well, the initial doc type uh, declaration, okay, we don't care too much. In short, we need to think in terms of elements. Um, elements are a type of node, the, more, the most common type of node, but we, can, we have also text, okay, which is not an element, but it's another different type of node. So text cannot contain uh, other text inside. That's the difference between the element and text, okay? The element can contain other text inside and the text cannot. And then there's the comment, okay? Um, okay, I think that's all we need to know about this uh, hierarchy, okay? This is the general hierarchy uh, on which the browser APIs about uh, DOM has been designed, okay? But in short, we need just need to know the difference between a node element and text, okay? Um, so the DOM API manipulates a set or lists of nodes. Set means an ordered list and list means ordered list of nodes, okay? So, um, uh, I mean, th this writing this way in JavaScript is not always nice because I told you we don't have a, a fully uh, object-oriented programming model in, in JavaScript. So we cannot really talk about types, okay? But if you think about uh, object-oriented programming, um, let's say, okay, let's say uh, we can say uh, there can be a node list, okay, which is a list of nodes. They could be, they should be classes in an object-oriented programming uh, style, okay? But in JavaScript, we don't have classes, but let's say uh, objects that have the same uh, uh, properties, we can consider them uh, uh, belonging to the same class, okay? That's why we say we have nodes and we have a node list and so on. Because if we know, if we say that the function returns uh, a certain type, it means it returns an object that we will have at least a certain number of methods and properties, okay? And in this sense, it resembles uh, classes in a traditional object-oriented programming language, okay? So, in short, we have nodes and list of nodes that we can handle. A node list works more or less like uh, a, an array of JavaScript. So, there's a length property, and we can use, uh, you know, the classical uh, uh, control uh, structures of JavaScript to, to handle this, uh, um, uh, this list. Like if it was an array, we can use a for of, a for each, and so on, okay? Uh, and so, now we only need to know how to get an handle to a node, okay? So that we can later work on this node and ask the browser to modify this node, okay? Like changing attributes, uh, appending other nodes, and so on. It's a tree, and we can modify this tree to this uh, through this function, okay? So, um, how to find this? Uh, actually, yeah, these are elements because they are all HTML tags, uh, okay? But they are also nodes in the hierarchy that we saw before. Okay, these are the functions that you need to know if you would like to program in JavaScript uh, uh, in the browser. You can get an element by ID, okay? So, it search uh, for a tag that has an attribute ID equal to some value that we specify here, okay? And that's why typically with uh, uh, attributes named ID, we would like to have a unique value, unique ID value for each ID in the page. Because so it's easier to get this element by using a call like get element by ID. It's a unique ID, it's a reference in the document that we can easily target with a call, okay? Um, we can also take more than one element and so getting not a node but a node list of um, 
of nodes. Uh, get elements, uh, not the S, the plural, by tag name, there can be more than one, or by class name, so everything that has a certain value for a class, okay? Class I is a way to say, uh, you know, uh, this, uh, uh, this node belongs to a certain class of elements, like the classes uh, in, in the object-oriented programming uh, style, okay? So they, they belong to the same family, okay? And then there are these two powerful uh, uh, um, uh, functions that allows you to select uh, um, nodes using the same CSS syntax that you learned uh, on Monday with my colleague Antonio, okay? So with the selectors, CSS selectors, okay? You know that uh, you can directly access uh, uh, some text uh, by the name, you can specify dot something to, you know, address the class with a certain value, you can specify hash something to address an ID, and you can mix them to do complex, uh, let's say, CSS addressing of elements. And you can do it uh, here as well, okay? So that's very, very convenient. Yeah, that's a question. The scope of each node. And I'm not sure what you mean by the scope of each node. Yeah, in a file. Yeah, no, no, you cannot define a private nodes or stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everything is in the document, and it's accessible through the document uh, uh, property. Yeah, th there's no private nodes. Okay, there can be nodes that are not attached to others, and we will see it, uh, them in the code because if you say uh, there will be something like uh, uh, what's this? Create element, okay? You create a new tag, let's say create a new div or new paragraph that is not attached to the tree yet, okay? In the sense, in a certain sense, it could be private. Uh, I'm not sure what, what we, how can we define private, but <laughs> you know, it's not attached to the tree, so it's not shown in the window, okay? It's just in the memory of the browser until we attach it to some place in the tree, okay? But otherwise, what we get here, uh, it's something that is in the document, so it's attached in the tree, okay? Thanks. Um, so I think we can, yeah, uh, just uh, have a look at this slide and then we will try to do something in the browser. So note that this, uh, this uh, function also works on nodes, not just on the document object. So I get a node, I can uh, do, uh, you know, get elements by class name, and in this case, the methods will work only through the descendant elements. So I'm on a certain node in the tree, I will look for things only in the sub part of the tree for which the node is actually the root. Let's say you are in a table and you are searching for all table or rows, okay? And there are many tables in the document. If you call a function to search all table or rows on the node of a certain table, it will return only the rows of that table. If you search it on, on document, it will return all the rows of all the tables, okay? Just a way to restrict, uh, you know, searching uh, using the same exact function as before, okay? So let's have a look. Let's, uh, uh, you know, take a document like the one I published uh, uh, for you for today's lecture. So let me see if we can uh, do something like this. Um, so where's the stuff? Uh, that I will use later, uh, AW Wix, Wix 05. I put what my colleague has done in HTML, CSS folder, just, you know, to make things clearer. And let's open the HTML file, uh, open with the browser Firefox, okay? 
So that's a basic uh, file on which we will work later. Uh, and let's have a look on how it is built. Okay. So here you find, uh, you know, the head section, the body section, the div uh, uh, that will contain a main uh, and the footer and so on. Okay. Um, let's say we would like to address the table. Okay. So get a reference to the table. What can we do? Well, actually, we need to program. Okay. Let's delete this one because it's already executing some uh, JavaScript for late. Okay. So just document get. Uh, I don't know. I need to choose between these uh, these uh, functions. Okay. Probably there's just one table. I would like to get the table. I know that the tag is named table. I can say get elements by get el uh, yeah get elements by tag name table. Okay, it's fine, and that's the result. Okay, it's a complex object, but in short, it's the table. Okay. And then I can work on this table with the code, okay? Of course, I should assign it to a variable. So uh, let's say const uh, const t equal uh, and so on. Okay, t should contain yeah the table, okay? It's just the expression, the whole expression that is undefined. I mean, what is left of const? Okay, and then I can work on this element, okay? I still don't have any uh, methods to work on these elements, but I can, you know, uh, I have a reference to this element, okay? Uh, which is the first step, okay? And so I can navigate the tree. I can uh, have a look at child nodes, okay? That's a possibility, okay? So uh, what's the... No, maybe the, not all the methods are put into the slides because otherwise the slides are get, uh, gets uh, you know filled up with uh, a lot of stuff which is not really useful. But you you should have uh, at least a hint of where to search. Okay, uh, we say the child nodes, right? Uh, child no HTML collection. It should be the child nodes somewhere. Uh, why is not showing us? No, uh, let's try it. Um, okay. Ah no, there are no child nodes. Sorry. That's uh, that's my initial uh, uh, HTML file. So let's open it. Yeah, actually, they're just a table head and table body, so they are not seen as child, probably. Okay. It's just empty because I didn't want to, you know, I, I want to add things dynamically later. Okay. Um, so attributes of the tag are exposed as properties. Okay. So let's say you have a body with an ID or whatever with an ID. And you can write dot ID or with the JavaScript notation, squared brackets and the name of the tag. And so you can basically navigate through the uh, elements and the, uh, in the page and access attributes, change attributes, and do all the things that you would like to do. Okay? Um, so, yeah, attributes. Uh, say if attributes work. No. no, that's something. Um, no, yeah, that should be. Ah, yeah, sorry. T. Uh, actually, it's get elements and returns an array. So actually, T0. Okay. T0 is actually the table. Okay. Yeah, I was a bit scared. Uh, so uh, attributes, okay. 
The attributes are class, and basically they're just class, okay? So in T0, uh, uh, we say the child nodes, okay? There are actually some text uh, which is actually blanks, T head and T body uh, and text, okay? So, yeah. So in short, Everything is mapped, including blank spaces, but basically blank spaces are useless for us. We will not care that much. If it's present or if it's not, the content is the same for the browser, okay? Just, you know, in the tree, also blanks are mapped, okay? So, fine. Um, okay, so you have a lot of uh, methods that then you can use to modify attributes. And remember, modifying attributes means uh, uh, you know, modifying how, uh, you know, the document uh, behaves uh, depending on what the attribute is supposed to do. Like the class attribute is the one that is typically set to give a certain appearance when you have a CSS that works on classes, okay? And, um, and other attributes can do other things in you know, a more specialized text, like uh, for the input elements and so on, okay? But we will see them later. Okay, how can we create new objects? New, new elements, actually, which are objects, of course, but uh, yeah. Actually, there are two methods, create element and create text node. As I was saying before, uh, when we create this, these elements, they are not attached to the tree. They are just elements in the memory of the browser. And then we will need to attach to the tree uh, to, to sh make them uh, appear in the, in, the, in the document, okay? Um, so, yeah. And then you, how do you add the element in the document? You take the element in, on which you would like to add, uh, you know, this new element, and you just say append child. That's the simplest way, and it appends a new child, so a new leaf to this in this tree at the end of all the other leaves. Okay, after all the other leaves. Okay, let's try. Okay, so um, let me take uh, this a span. Okay. So that's a document that you already have on the GitHub, okay? So actually, it's empty, right? So that, that has an ID, okay? I, I've put an ID because I would like to write code like this. Uh, let's say const uh, time, okay? Document get uh, element by ID time, okay? Time. Is actually that span, okay, which is empty at the moment. Let's create uh, a new, uh, oops, sorry, a new, um, a new element. Uh, const, oops, const uh, l. Document. Not that I never write window, eh? I, I, I can write window, window dot document, uh, and et cetera. That's the same, but actually window is uh, always, uh, you know, uh, doesn't need to be specified, okay? Create uh, element, and let's create a P, okay? L, L actually is a P, paragraph, okay? But you see nothing, Nothing is happening now. I mean, it's just a P, it's not in the tree, it's just in the memory of the browser. Um, let's create uh, a, a text node, okay, should work. Uh, where's the browser? Const uh, text. Uh, document uh, create uh, text uh, node uh, I don't know 14 okay 
let's attach the text to the to the p okay so actually l uh, append child text okay nothing happens yet it's just two uh, elements in the memory of the browser that has been connected now i take this element the the p the paragraph and attach it to the main tree okay i got it before at the time right time uh, append child child uh, l okay note that you know the span was here uh, besides the corporate web application string okay you see something has appeared here okay not that big <laughs> so it's just a you know just a try we didn't set the size of the font uh, or we didn't set a class to make it better and so on but something has appeared in the main window of the browser okay so actually these two elements that i've created by using just code javascript code are in the memory of the browser and now they are attached uh, to the main tree and when they are attached in the main tree they get rendered by the browser in the window okay so i i, I worked outside the tree and then i attach things in the tree but i can also do the opposite so deleting elements in the tree and so on okay so there's plenty of methods to handle everything inside this tree okay so there are just uh, experiments that you can do you know to modify the HTML in the browser, directly in the browser. And as we did it in the console, you can do it in your JavaScript program. That's exactly the same because the environment is exactly the same. Okay? Uh, where well, there are append, prepend, whatever, depending on where you want to put the, th the, the things. Okay? Actually, there are also properties. Okay? We need to be a bit careful with properties rather than methods, and we'll tell you why in a minute. But actually, in short, the property inner HTML allows you to specify a string that is then appended as a child in, uh, uh, to the element in the, uh, in the element. If the element is in the tree, in the browser tree, actually uh, it will get rendered. So everything which is inside inner HTML will be interpreted as HTML code, will be parsed, will be transformed in, into a subtree that is attached where you put the uh, inner HTML. Okay? Let's try. Okay? So we again have time. Okay? So time inner HTML equal to what can, can we write here? Let's say, uh, whatever, I don't know the time. Um, let's have a second span, okay? Span. Um, style. Uh, uh, font. Font. Color. Red. Uh, po po uh, my time, my time, my time, what a span, yeah, okay, no, there's something wrong with the style, but it doesn't matter, actually, you know, what what has been done, okay, maybe it's uh, not font, font color, what, we'll have a look, at, we'll debug it, okay, but you see here, uh, you have this, uh, oh okay, font color, but probably it's not font color, face, whatever. Font. Anyway, you have this, uh, uh, this HTML that you specify with inner HTML, okay, it has been interpreted as HTML code and has been rendered according to what the HTML code says, okay? So you can basically put whatever you like inside the inner HTML, okay? 
I actually don't remember why the font color doesn't work. Maybe it's as another name. Huh? Color? Okay, might be. Let's try. Uh, so, color. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, we just overwrite the previous content. We also means that we can simply delete everything which is uh, a child of this node by setting an empty string. Okay? Which is uh, sometimes convenient uh, also for the labs and so on. Okay? So basically instead of destroying each single element in the tree and so on, we will destroy everything but just setting inner HTML as empty string. Okay? Um, yeah. Uh, let's have a look at the slide. Just be careful that the browser interprets the content as HTML. So if in this HTML we write script, uh, etc., and we load the program and so on, the program will be loaded and executed. Okay? So thinking in terms of security, we need to be careful because if we are setting uh, we are sure about what we are setting as HTML, that's fine. But if some part of this HTML comes from an, ins an insecure source, like from the user, from some places where it can be manipulated by malicious users, you know, using this property can be dangerous. Okay? We will come back on these things, uh, uh, I think, next, uh, next lecture when we will talk about the cross-site scripting. Okay? But in short, it's, ve it's a very convenient way to create HTML without, uh, you know, writing too much code. Because, you know, writing a string is easier than writing create element, append child, create element, append child, and so on. Okay? Uh, you can append in different places and so on. Uh, this, uh, no, this one more property I would like uh, to, to show you which is not on the slide, sorry. There is also the inner text, okay, property, which doesn't allow you to write HTML inside, okay? That's safer <laughs> than, than the other because it doesn't get interpreted as HTML. So it's just for text. Sometimes you just need to change the text inside your document and the inner, the inner text is, for, is uh, very convenient, okay? So, now it is 14.09, okay? So it appears here, it's just text, okay? So it creates uh, basically, it creates a, a text uh, object, a text element, okay? And you can always remember, you can always debug all this stuff that we, we are doing, okay? I, I might be wrong as I was before, <laughs> okay? So what can I do? I can go to the you know, to the HTML uh, inspector and see what is happening. You see, now there's just uh, one text node here inside the span, okay? If I created a new span with the H inner HTML, there would be a, 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 a further span inside the other one, okay? And so on. You can always, uh, you know, debug everything you do and I invite you to debug stuff because when you will do the project by yourself, you will need to be able to debug your stuff, okay? So, um, okay, let's go back to the slides. Uh, you, do, you can do a lot of operations. I mean, it's useless that we stay here, you know, to say, you know, wh which operation can be done, etc. Just be aware that basically, if you think about inserting something, creating nodes, deleting nodes, and so on, there probably there's a method that does it for you, okay? You don't need to start, you know, from scratch. So you can even clone the nodes uh, with shallow copy or just full copy, so deep copy, the whole tree below that node and so on, okay? Uh, you can also address uh, attributes. We already saw the set attribute, but for a class, which is a very, very special attribute because in short, we use it a lot for styling elements in the page. 
There's a, a, a property, a special property, which is called class name on every object, uh, by which you can easily modify the classes attached to a node, okay? Because it's so useful that they created a special property. Actually, they couldn't create it with the name dot .class. So actually, class is a reserved keyword in JavaScript, even if it has no classes. But there are certain implementation of classes in JavaScript. But I mean, we will not uh, explain this in, in the course. But uh, in short, we couldn't use class like we cannot use for, OK? And so the property name is class name and not class, OK? And you can use class name just to set, uh, you know, uh, class, the, the whole string for the class. So what you would write uh, in the value of the attribute class. Or you can handle it as a list. You know that you can add more than one class. You saw bo Bootstrap uh, with my colleague Antonio on Monday. You, you know that you can add uh, different classes to achieve uh, a certain behavior, like defining you know, the size, call three, and then the background, BG something, uh, the color, etc. Okay. And so in short, you have add, remove, even toggle, so activate and deactivate a class name if, if it's present or not, okay? Because sometimes you have, uh, you know, the necessity to, to toggle stuff. Uh, so like a click and click again to make it appear again, okay? Um, style, style is another special property. Because uh, it's the attribute that we were using before, okay? It's basically the way in which you can define, uh, um, uh, you know, inline CSS, okay? And so, again, this uh, style, which is, contains all CSS properties, okay? You can uh, even get computer style, but I mean, there are details, I think, so. Um, okay, just a uh, few... A few words about the, the event handling, and then we will uh, stop for the break, okay? And I also prepared the example. So we saw the tree, we saw the elements, and we saw that we can manipulate elements, right? So we can create new elements, we can attach the elements to the tree, we can change properties, and so on, okay? One thing that we are missing, and uh, I was telling you in the beginning, is that we would like to react to action of the users on certain elements in the page, okay? The typical action is the click, okay? Or tap if you are on a mobile phone or on a mobile device, okay? So how can we handle these situations? Well, actually, uh, the browser, of course, supports this uh, uh, um, this system, okay, with an event-driven programming model. So it means that uh, when uh, the event happens, so the click or double click or mouse movement or whatever happens, uh, we will react in the sense that the browser will call a function that we attach to this element, okay. And the function actually will not be called, will be put into the message queue or the callback queue. And if the browser is doing nothing, it will take it from the message queue or callback queue, put it into the call stack and execute the code, okay? That's why it's important uh, that the browser typically does nothing because it can react to events immediately, okay? Because it goes into the callback queue and then it immediately gets executed, okay? So, um, there are different types of events. As I told you, just an example. Click, left click, right click, double click, and so on, okay? Um, um, and, uh, uh, and then there's the element on which the event happened, okay? So I clicked in a certain place, and this place contains a certain element. So this is the, what's this, the uh, H2 element, okay? Answer is H2 element. 
the button is the button element somewhere in the HTML and so on. Okay? So there's a type of the event and the element on which it happens. Uh, which is actually unfortunately called event target. Even though actually it's the source of the event. <laughs> okay? But the terminology is that uh, that's the event target. Okay? And I say it's the target on which you clicked because you typically click, but I mean Th that's the terminology, okay? A and also the name of the attribute that we will see later, okay? So how can we attach our code to some element that responds to a certain event? Well, there's this very convenient function, add event listener, okay? That can attach a code of a function responding to a certain event that happens to a, on a certain element, okay? So each element has the possibility to attach an event, okay? So in short, we say um, um, on a certain element, link, okay? Let's say the link could be a button, could be whatever you want, a table, uh, a P, a paragraph, uh, and so on. Add event listener, when you, something happens, you press the button, okay? Actually, that's not a click, it's just a press, not a release, okay? Mouse button pressed, well, as usual, we do a console log, <laughs> okay? But you can do whatever you want. You can trigger the loading of new information. You can change the appearance of the page, and so on. You can do whatever you want, okay? So let's... Let's try it, okay? Uh, th there are plenty of, uh, of uh, events. I know it's uh, small, but, uh, you know, you, you'll find a, a lot of places where you find a list of events. But basically, we are focusing typically on very, very few events, like the click event, that is the really typical event in, in web application, okay? And then there will be submit uh, and change uh, that we will use uh, often. But we will come back to these events when, when it's time. Okay, so let's try uh, something. So let's say we click, uh, yeah, on the time. Okay, I like this time. <laughs> I put the ID just to show you stuff. Okay, so time, add even listener. Okay. Uh, click, if I remember the syntax correctly, let me check, uh, yes, and then, and then you need to pass a callback, okay, we learned callback in JavaScript, because, because then, now, we need to pass callbacks, we need to define, and actually pass, we do the same thing, the both things uh, at the same time, we define it here, but at the same time, we are passing it to the add event listener, Okay, so uh, the callback uh, takes uh, one parameter, which is actually an object, event, okay, and as usually here we do just a console log, okay, console ops, well actually we attach the something that will not work, but uh, We'll think about it later. Uh, console log clicked. Okay? No. Um, time. Okay? So console log clicked. Let's say, let's see if it works. Yes, I'm clicking on the time here, the string. Okay? Just clicking. No, oops. Yes, uh, just, uh, you know, uh, uh, this compacts uh, all, the, all, the, all the rows that are the same in, in one row, and then it says how many times has been uh, um, developed, has been, uh, has happened, okay? So I c if I click again, you see click again, okay? Just to not to pollute too much the console, the browser by default, uh, you know, it says uh, the row is the same and it's been repeated four times, okay? 
but actually it printed four times. So as you see, it's very, very easy to add code for an event on a certain element, okay? And I can do whatever I like. I can, uh, I don't know, let me think what can we do. We can take the table. Yeah, let's try. Uh, I think that was the table, right? No, T0 was the table. Inner HTML. Okay. Well, we just destroy the table. Okay. This just attach the handler. Okay. So until I click, nothing happens. This is just a function that has been attached as an event handler for the click event on, on the time. Okay. Now I go and click. Okay. Please look because the table will disappear. I cannot make it disappear again. Okay. You see, I modified the DOM because I said, well, now the tree under table is empty. Okay, there are no texts. Okay, I cannot make them uh, reappear. I just destroyed those, that part of HTML. I, I can make them reappear if I reload the page. But if I reload the page, I, I lose the JavaScript context. Okay, because the context is actually uh, binded together with the page. Okay. I, I, I didn't save these actions in, in a file. If I save it in a file, I can reload the same action as well. Okay? But at the moment, I'm working in the console, so the console is just attached to the page that has been loaded. If I reload the page, I reload the console as well. Okay? So, you see, it's very easy to, to work with uh, you know, event objects. Okay? You even have uh, the possibility to know which was the target, actually, so the element that created the event, okay? Um, yeah, Le let's have a, a look at this again, one more. Event console log, console log event target, okay? Nothing happens now if I click, you see, where there was a, a, an, an event, um, actually an event handler before that uh, printed uh, clicked, but there is a second event handler that prints uh, the element that generated the event, which is actually the span, okay? So I can do whatever I like in this uh, event handler. And I can also access the element that created the event. And this will be useful quite a lot because sometimes you want to attach multiple event handlers to different uh, elements and you need to distinguish which element has been clicked. And either you modify the code, but it's you know, inconvenient because you need to write more code, so different handlers, or you write the same handler but then in the handler, you access the element as has generated the event, and then you decide what to do depending on which element has generated the event. Let's say different rows in the table. We will do it uh, in the second part of this lecture. Different rows of the table, and either you create a closure <laughs> on, the, on the element, or you have some attributes in the element that tells you which element I has been uh, the source of the event? So the source of the click. Which element has been clicked in short? Okay? And with this uh, value of the attribute, you'll decide what to do. Okay? Dele delete a certain element or load new data and so on. Okay? Uh, let me see if I told you everything. Yes, there's plenty of events. You can play with these events, but we will use basically three. Click, submit, and change, okay? And today, just click, because it's the easiest one, right? Um, just uh, last thing, and then we will, uh, we will break. 
Um, remember that uh, sometimes there's a predefined behavior for events. Like a click on a link in the browser will load a new page. We'll have a look at the link, go and load a new page, a new resource. Okay? This is not what we would like to have in uh, single page applications. So if we have links, well, we can avoid using links. That's uh, one option. But if for some reason we need to have links, if we would like to have uh, clicks on these links handled by the application, we need to tell the browser to avoid the default behavior. So this uh, method that you can call on the event object in the event handler prevent the browser from doing the default action, which is actually loading something in the case of a click or submitting a form in the case of a form. Okay? That's the only two uh, cases in which basically we need to do, uh, remember to do this uh, call. Okay? To prevent the browser from uh, doing its uh, default behavior, okay? which is actually will reload the page and so in short destroy our client application. Okay? Um, yeah, uh, the rest is not so useful at the moment, I would say. So I would break here, okay, for 10 minutes more or less. And in the second part, we will uh, finish these slides talking about forms and have a look at an example so you have something to work on for Monday's lab. Okay? Thank you.